evening for the second in the series of online lectures. Uh, before I start, I should like to give you a brief overview of the Atelier Flower Field. We are a not-for-profit organized art organization. We offer a variety of art classes online and in studio in different mediums for all levels and ages. We have an art gallery where we present exhibitions throughout the year. Our current one is the Pandemic Show and paintings can be purchased through our online art store accessed through our website, theatelieratflowerfield.org. Tonight, we welcome Nancy Puckner, who is an advisor to the Stony Brook University Scholars Program and has been a professor of art history, specializing in American art, contemporary art, and indigenous art. She will be discussing Winslow Homer's indigenous subjects with particular reference to his portrait of Montauk chief, David Farrow. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer period. Please send us your questions via the Q&A box. This lecture will be recorded and posted on our website. And I shall now hand you over to Nancy Putner. Welcome. Thank you very much, Gabby. Um, thank you so much to the Atelier, um, to Gabby and Brianna and Joan um, for helping organize everything tonight. I'm, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to do this. Um, and thank you to everyone who's here. I can't actually see you because it's a webinar format, but I know you're out there and I so appreciate you tuning in tonight. I know we're all a little weary of um, Zoom and virtual events right now. And I, I sympathize with that. And I so appreciate you all coming. Um, I am really excited to be speaking about this work tonight. This is actually um, work that I began uh, back as a graduate student at Indiana University. And um, having no idea that 10 years later, I would move to Long Island and be um, so close to the actual origin of the um, artwork that I'm speaking about. So I'm you know, especially excited to give this talk on Long Island. Um, to Long Islanders, and you know, hopefully, this is something that I can get back to and and continue. Um, I'm gonna. I have a bit of a PowerPoint prepared. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay, here we go. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this and maximize that. Okay, hopefully you're all seeing um, this wonderful portrait by Winslow Homer. Um, and within a larger project, I, um, I consider this portrait uh, kind of within Homer's overall relationship to modernity. Um, that's where the title comes from. Um, today, I think I'm, I'm just going to kind of unpack the portrait and you know, attempt to decipher some of its uh, meanings and, and also consider, um, you know, what it might have meant to a 19th century uh, audience at the time. Um, so before I speak too much about the uh, portrait specifically, I'll just try to give um, a brief and general uh, introduction to Winslow Homer. Uh, he was a, a very iconic artist in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, he worked mostly in oil uh, and also watercolor. He was uh, born in Boston, spent much of his time in New York uh, during his career and ended up in a studio in Maine at the end of his life. Um, Homer became very well known for engaging with uh, modern subject matter, kind of in his own brand of realism that was actually like very avant-garde um, for this time in America. The, um, so the painting on the left um, this is a depiction of like middle-class women uh, visiting a popular seaside resort in New Jersey. Um, this is what the beach looked like in 1869. This is what the women look like. And you know where the whole sort of avant-garde comes in is that middle-class women were not really the content of um, exhibition paintings at this time. So, um, you know, Homer was also like very much on the cutting edge of, of politics in his time. So this is, you know, the painting on the left was done in 1869, kind of toward the end of the Victorian age in America. Women are experiencing and enjoying a lot of new freedoms, you know, going out in public alone, 
Um, and Homer's capturing that in his art. So for the time, this is a, a really very progressive uh, subject. Um, there's always also a sort of ambivalence to Homer's art. Um, it's never really clear if he's just recording or if he's commenting or maybe poking some fun. Um, the women's bodies in this uh, painting on the left are, are definitely modern. Um, they're also a little bit kind of distorted out of shape by their, you know, really up to the minute fashions. The, the bustle and the corset that women were wearing at this time was pretty regularly uh, sort of satirized in, in popular sources. And, you know, in many ways, the, the girl of the period or the modern woman uh, was often kind of mocked and stereotyped uh, because people were so uncomfortable with you know, changing gender roles. And Homer recorded all of this in his art. It's um, it's kind of hard to tease out what he might be saying if he's saying anything at all, um, but that's often the case with his painting. And it's, it's one of the things that I think makes it um, all the more interesting. Um, and the painting on the right, he was also known for uh, like landscapes and seascapes, paintings with a, a lot of energy. Um, this is actually a, a a particularly modern uh, subject as well. It's a, a depiction of a Coast Guard uh, saving a shipwreck, shipwrecked woman uh, with a, a breeches buoy. A uh, breeches buoy is a device that was invented right before the time of this painting. It's basically a buoy with these canvas breeches attached that could uh, like zip line someone to safety from a ship. So it was, you know, brand new, just patented was this new modern technology. Um, and, you know, it's like with most of his works, it's not really clear if, if that's all that he's doing. I mean, is he commenting? Is there some sexual tension in the painting? Um, people have uh, often seen allusions to death in this work, kind of tied up with all of these new mechanisms of modernization. Um, some people see allusions to Homer's own death in this painting. Um, there are a lot of questions about Homer's art. It's really one of the um, kind of interesting things about him. Um, another very interesting thing about his career, um, he actually began his career in art as an illustrator. Uh, he worked for a number of popular magazines in the 1850s and 60s, and he did a lot of magazine work uh, during the Civil War. He would actually uh, visit the front lines. Um, Harper's New Monthly Magazine, which was a, a really popular periodical at the time, published out of New York, uh, they sent him to the front lines as what they called their uh, special reporter. Uh, so this is a, a pretty well-known uh, wood engraving on the left. It's a, a depiction of a sharpshooter from the Union Army and a perched in a tree. Um, you know, and ag again, with his, like with his paintings, um, in his engravings, you know, these are, are incredibly modern subjects, you know, based on real observations, this is new weapon technology, you know, the use of these like highly trained marksmen was, was pretty new to 19th century combat. Um, he did some very interesting works for Harper's around this time. And again, um, you know, just like in his oil painting, it's, it's um it's kind of tough to discern if Homer is you know just recording if he's commenting if he's criticizing you know this is not the kind of of war imagery that audiences were used to you know this isn't a depiction of a war hero he's he's really a killer like sitting in a tree um, picking people off and you know at the same time he's very vulnerable he's kind of perched up in this tree in this really precarious way. Um, so there's this characteristic ambivalence um, going all the way back to, to Homer's uh, wood engravings for magazines. It's really often difficult to discern what he's actually saying. Um, and this is true of his post-war engravings as well. So the, uh, the engraving on the right, um, this piece was also published in Harper's and with a caption that tells us um, this is a, a captain who's returned home from war uh, to find that his wife has learned to drive a horse and buggy. Uh, so, you know, like many people at the time, he's kind of struggling to accept her new independence. Um, the sort of tension in the image between the husband and wife is, is you know, very much indicative of larger post-war concerns surrounding 
the evolving roles of women, both, you know, in public and private spaces. And um, Homer was very good at depicting current events. And he really just sort of poked at the tensions that American culture was experiencing. And he did it in, um, you know, really thoughtful, thoughtful ways in his work. Um, a lot of scholars believe that Homer's work as an illustrator uh, really contributed really contributed to what became uh, this almost like mythical obsession with his honesty as an artist. So Homer was very routinely praised as, as being um, what critics called a genuine artist who always painted what he saw. So these are a few excerpts from uh, reviews during his career and shortly after his career. Um, so one, one review says Homer is a genuine painter whose only care is to see and to reproduce what he sees. Homer paints what he has seen. He tells what he has felt. He records what he knows. Homer painted absolutely as he saw. His absolute honesty accounted for the direct and forceful character of his paintings. So Homer really was considered a realist and according to critics, uh, his works just didn't lie. Um, so what I became very interested in is how Homer's indigenous subjects sort of fit within what was perceived to be this very authentic American vision. Um, so as some of you might already understand, there was a very different set of rules when depicting native subjects as opposed to white subjects in the 19th century. Um, so before I get into the portrait itself, I, I also want to kind of set the context for uh, how Native Americans were represented at the time. Um, and this might be, you know, simplifying a bit, but, but really generally speaking, um, visual representations of Native Americans uh, fell into kind of three general stereotypes, like leading up to the time of Homer's career. Um, so on the left, uh, this is a painting by Charles Bird King. Uh, he was an artist who did a lot of portraits of indigenous vis visitors to Washington. Uh, these are members of a delegation that uh, visited DC in the early 19th century. Um, and this is a rep representation of what we would call the noble savage. Uh, so the noble savage is typically characterized by uh, this sort of um, like simultaneity, right? There's, there's this duality happening. There's the inherent, you know, savagery but there's also this sort of constructed understanding that the Indians' savage ways could be tamed by this also inherent nobility that was just, you know, under the surface. And it was the responsibility of more civilized whites to kind of draw out and cultivate that nobility. So typically we see these, you know, concurrent forces uh, visualized through accoutrement within the within the painting. So, you know, the central most figure in King's painting, he's holding this uh, war club that's really menacing. But at the same time, around his neck, he's wearing a peace medal, which was a gift from President Monroe at the time. And it kind of modifies that threat. Uh, so we see this in a really wide range of images from the 18th and 19th century. It's a very constructed or imagined, you know, concept of Native people. Um, individual identity is, is sort of sacrificed. And, you know, these are really the artists or um, actually more accurately the patrons. So in this case, the U.S. government. Um, these are their ideas of Native Americans rather than accurate portrayals. You know, this is how they wanted, this is how they wanted to understand Native Americans um, as a threat, but one that could be contained and modified through assimilation. Um, so that's the painting on the left. The, um, the next, you know, very common stereotype that we see in visual art from this time is um, a different kind of savage, a more violent or, or sort of bloodthirsty savage. Um, this type of image had a similar agenda though. Uh, so this central painting, this is a um, this is a representation of Jane McCrae, who was a, a resident of the British colonies, who was killed by Mohawk warriors during the Revolutionary War. 
Um, so the the Indian figures in this the in this image, the Mohawks are um, you know they're very idealized in this kind of classicizing Greek god kind of way, um, but they're also you know very demonic and dangerous and out of control. Um, depictions of Native Americans as a, a sort of vicious enemy to whites were becoming uh, very popular in the 19th century essentially to help justify the destruction of native cultures and, and also justify the expropriation of, of Indian lands. Um, and then finally on the right, uh, this is an example of a third type of constructed stereotype. This is what we would call the vanishing Indian. So in um, Tom, Tompkins Madison's painting on the right, um, these Indian figures have been like literally pushed to the edge of the North American continent and the Pacific Ocean behind them kind of represents the end of the line for them and, and by association, you know, tens of thousands of other Native American families. And, you know, unlike the image in the center, uh, they don't fight, they just sort of passively accept their fate. Uh, and as Native Americans lost, you know, more and more power throughout the 19th century, as they were removed further west and put into reservation systems, um, this type of, of sort of vanishing uh, stereotype really served to romanticize and uh, just sort of soften and, and ultimately justify that process. Um, so this is the, the sort of visual context in which Native Americans were represented by white artists. Um, this is how they were understood by a white audience. And this is how they were you know, consumed by white viewers, uh, sort of leading up to and during the time of Homer's career. Um, Homer did not do it very often, but he did paint indigenous subjects at, at two different points in his career. This was the uh, first time. So this is what I started to wonder uh, when I first encountered this portrait. You know, if, if representations of, of native subjects in the 19th century are so steeped in these stereotypes, you know, did Homer, this, you know, special, honest artist, did he paint what he saw as, you know, the critics and, and the American public really expected and, and always celebrated in his art? Or did Homer sort of depart from his loyalty to the genuine? And did these per pervasive 19th century stereotypes kind of get in the way of his honest portrayal of native subjects? Um, so this is what I've been trying to determine. And I'll kind of present to you now, um, you know, some of the ways that I've been going about trying to answer this question. Uh, so first, you know, a little background on the um, painting itself. Um, this is a watercolor that Homer painted in July of 1874 while he was traveling on Eastern Long Island. It's a, a representation of David Farrow, who at the time uh, was sachem or chief of the Montaukett Indians. Uh, so the Montaukett are an Algonquian speaking nation and they originate from the eastern end of Long Island. Um, around this time, the Montaukett were also uh, referred to uh, very often by white people as the Montauk. Uh, so the town of Montauk and the Montaukett people um, were often sort of conflated uh, by whites. And um, this was not actually a name that they used themselves. Um, Montaukett was a place name that was uh, given by the colonists when they designated uh, the group as a tribe uh, during early contact. Um, so Homer traveled to the East End in 1874, you know, likely just as a tourist and as an artist, you know, don't, no different really, excuse me, than um, people do today. There is no uh, written evidence uh, describing the circumstances surrounding the portrait's completion. And this is a very frustrating part of studying Homer. Um, he didn't leave a lot of archival evidence behind. You know, some artists will leave like diary after diary and uh, you can read every thought that was in their mind during every work of art that they created. Um, with Homer, it's just, you know, like a letter here and a a dirty drawing there, there's not much to go on. Um, it also kind of makes it fun to try to connect the dots ourselves, but you know, it would also be nice if we had some actual tangible evidence telling us why he painted this portrait. 
Um, so we don't have that to go on. We don't have Homer's own, you know, explanation. Um, we do have some other things to go on though. Um, so first of all, there's a, an inscription on the painting. So you can see it in the uh, bottom right. It says Winslow Homer, East Hampton, July 21, 1874. So we can assume uh, that it was drawn from life because it has that um, exact date on it. Um, we also know, and this is not something that you can see in reproductions, but the phrase last of the Montauks is written, uh, it's actually written on the lower edge of the painting's uh, mounting sheet. So it's not visible in reproductions, but records of the work uh, tell us that it's there. And that phrase really says a lot, right? So in the context of all of those stereotypes that I just mentioned, um, last of the Montauks, uh, it, it fits within this tradition at the time of generalizing often pretty well-known Native Americans as the final surviving member of a particular tribe or nation. Um, it was a popular designation for many indigenous people, and it was almost always 100% inaccurate when it was used. Uh, we know this through census records. We know this really just through the fact that so many Native peoples are still around us um, who are members of groups that were memorialized by any number of, you know, the last of uh, their particular nation. Um, in terms of no numbers of, of Montauket, um, the numbers are, are really kind of hard to pin down at this time. Um, there's a, a historian of, of the Montauket named John Strong, who's uh, published quite a bit about them. And uh, he states that the um, federal census for um, 1870 listed a total of 21 Montauket living at Montauk at the time, so just before this portrait. Um, apparently, though, the, um, the assistant census marshal who reported this number never actually made what was at that time a half-day trip. Um, to the east end of Long Island to actually make the count in person. So it's not an entirely reliable number. Um, Strong has also estimated that by uh, 1879, there were probably only about a dozen Montauket living on Indian fields, which was the sort of designated residence for Montauket on Long Island. Um, but these, you know, these really small numbers don't account for all of the relatives kind of scattered throughout Long Island who still considered that area their homeland. So, you know, exact numbers can be pretty difficult to pin down, but we do know, you know, with certainty that Pharaoh was not the last of the Montaukets or the Montauk as Homer uh, and others often called them. So, you know, what does it mean that this phrase is written on Homer's portrait of Pharaoh? And the, you know, the phrase is, has taken on some significance. It's come to serve as a title for the work. So in, you know, catalogs and auction records, this is always the title uh, that the work is referred to by. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's no way to actually tell if Homer wrote it himself or if someone else attached it to the work after the fact. And I have really tried uh, to get to the bottom of that. The, um, the provenance history of this painting includes uh, two institution, the institutions that I've actually been able to talk to. Uh, so the portrait was sold by a collector and handled briefly by uh, Herschel and Adler Galleries in New York in 2006, uh, before it was sold to another private collector. Herschel and Adler have no record of having taken the work out of its frame. So they never saw the mounting sheet, which is where the title is written. Uh, but the work was sold again at auction uh, by Christie's New York in 2014. And Christie's is, is very thorough and they uh, likely took it out of the frame. Um, any condition photos that they would have taken at the time of the sale, which would reveal if the inscription was actually in Homer's handwriting, those cannot be shared without the current owner's express consent. And the current owner of this portrait has not responded to any of my inquiries um, about that matter. So, you know, maybe someday this will, this will come to surface, but right now we don't know. Uh, if Homer himself gave Pharaoh this stereotype or if it was someone else that attached that, um, that name to the work. 
Um, even without that detail though, even without knowing um, if this was uh, Homer's title or not, uh, we can decipher a lot from the portrait itself. Um, you know, I was very struck by this work. Generally speaking, it's, you know, it's a very odd work of art. It's definitely not a traditional portrait, right? Pharaoh is standing in this kind of three quarter profile. His arms are crossed. He's looking down and away from the viewer. His body is, you know, really strangely and abruptly kind of cut off at the knee. His hair is all unkempt. His gaze is distant. You know, generally speaking, he looks very disengaged and, and very detached. And this is not what we think of, you know, with 19th century portraiture, especially portraits of leaders or, you know, otherwise important individuals. Um, so, you know, this is very different than typical portraits from the time. Um, not only is it very different than traditional portraiture, you know, generally speaking, it's also pretty different from um, other depictions of Pharaoh at the time as well. Um, he was fairly well known during his lifetime, and he was referenced in um, a couple different examples of popular media uh, that I found. Uh, here's one example of the um, returning to that periodical that Homer worked for during the Civil War, uh, Harper's New Monthly Magazine. Um, in 1871, uh, Charles Parsons published a travel essay about Montauk Point. And in that essay, he included a discussion of the Montauket. So he characterized the uh, dozen, what he said dozen or so Montauket uh, that he said at the time occupied the area. Um, he characterized them as idle and worthless, except their king and queen, and he means Pharaoh and his wife, Maria, uh, their king and queen, who he described as industrious, quiet citizens. Um, Parsons never actually met Pharaoh. He never visited him in person uh, while he was on Long Island. And this illustration uh, that was in his Harper's essay uh, was probably copied from another existing illustration or from a photograph. Um, but the sketch, you know, it, it kind of echoes his laudatory description of Pharaoh. And it's a much more traditional, you know, bus length portrait style than Homer's. Um, Pharaoh's sitting in an upright position. You know, he and his wife are very thoughtfully engaging the viewer. Their clothing is very composed. Their hair is very well coiffed. You know, all of these standard portrait conventions of, you know, pose and gaze and comportment all of this sort of comes together to evoke this sense of a, of a strong moral character, right? And that's missing from Homer's. You know, this is a very di different depiction uh, than Homer's. Um, considering how uh, Pharaoh was uh, depicted within popular media at the time or, or Long Island media um, to be more specific, uh, this characterization of Pharaoh as, you know, industrious um, by Parsons in 1871, that was not by any means a, a sentiment that was um, unanimously held by Long Island citizens at the time. Uh, there are varying opinions of Pharaoh on Long Island uh, published during the time that he was sachem. Uh, white landowners especially had a much less positive um, opinion of Pharaoh. These are uh, two excerpts that I'm showing you from the uh, Journal of the Trustees of the Freeholders and Commonality of the Town of East Hampton, New York. So the Journal of Landowners, uh, essentially. Uh, they described Pharaoh as um, shiftless in his habits while he was alive, and they attributed his uh, shattered constitution and his death to um, what was called those vices, which are so common uh, with the Aborigine. And Pharaoh actually died of pulmonary tuberculosis. So, you know, they were a bit off in that regard. Um, it's not that out of the ordinary for two different sources to describe the same individual in two vastly different ways, especially when it came to Native American subjects at this time, you know, whose identities were being constructed, you know, in a range of different ways for a range of different reasons. Um, you know, ultimately, like contradictory descriptions of Native Americans, whether the same group or in this case, the same individual, um, these types of contradictions were pretty common. And they tell us um, very clearly that conceptions of indigenous peoples were not necessarily accurate. They were 
filtered through you know the shifting fears and desires of whites and they were shaped to fit whatever stereotyped belief best supported their cause so you know harpers wanted to sell magazines so charles parsons romanticized pharaoh and white landowners wanted to justify their dishonest acquisition of land so they demonized pharaoh so this is pretty easy to figure out when we look at these contemporary representations of Pharaoh, but I, you know, keep coming back to the question of, of what was Homer doing? You know, was he painting what he saw or did he have a motive uh, like these other sources? Excuse me. Um, so these other sources of Pharaoh, um, or sorry, these other descriptions of Pharaoh, um, these, fit pretty easily within, you know, the common Native American stereotypes that I was, um, that I mentioned and, and sort of went through earlier. And, you know, one of the ways that I've tried to read uh, Homer's portrait of Pharaoh is to look for the ways that these common stereotypes might surface within it. And I do think that characteristics of, of, um, of a couple of stereotypes can be found. Um, the noble savage, uh, for one. So, um, Looking at Pharaoh's face, um, you know, he has this very, uh, very sunken cheeks and this kind of protruding mouth. It's not a very flattering image by any means, which doesn't necessarily mean that Homer's depicting Pharaoh as, you know, quote unquote savage. Um, but something that I noticed is that Pharaoh's features um, bear a strong resemblance to the features of another of Homer's male subjects. Um, so this is an oil painting from 1891 uh, that's entitled Huntsmen and Dogs. Uh, this was one of Homer's uh, first uh, hunting scenes, and it, it marks this shift into what could be called a much harsher uh, style of realism in his art. He's essentially painting uh, the brutality of, um, of hunting for pleasure, and Homer was fascinated by that subject. Um, his audience was utterly shocked and, and pretty disgusted by it. You know, this is still the 19th century. People rarely painted, you know, gruesome subjects like this one in a very realistic way. Um, critics were not fond of this work. Uh, one critic described the painting as um, what he called low and brutal in the extreme. Um, and then another critic I found, uh, interestingly, uh, kind of zeroed in on the hunter himself. And he said that the, um, this is a quote from a, a um, review at the time, he said the facial expression of the man is as wild as the animal he has captured. Um, so to this critic, Homer really captured the hunter's kind of untamed and savage nature, right? And I, I find a pretty strong similarity um, between the facial features of the hunter and those of Pharaoh. Um, now, even though we don't have the benefit of a critical response to Homer's portrait because he never exhibited it, um, critics reacted you know, very harshly to the figure of the hunter when Homer first exhibited Huntsman and Dogs. And you know, I'm not saying that Homer was, was necessarily modeling one on the other. You know, they're 20 years apart and they have nothing to do with one another, but maybe the features that signified uh, brutality in one painting, you know, maybe they also did in another. Um, so if Pharaoh's face could be understood as, as having this kind of brutal or savage um, uh, sort of demeanor to it, then we would also need to have the corresponding, you know, nobility to uh, sort of counterbalance that, um, that quote unquote savage uh, aspect to the work to complete that noble savage stereotype. Um, I see that actually in uh, one of the only other real details of the uh, portrait, that being Pharaoh's suit. Uh, so he's wearing this, um, this common work shirt kind of under a, um, a vest and trousers. Uh, it's probably made of cotton or linen. Um, and the outfit is you know, distinctly European in its style. The suit uh, very much situates Pharaoh in the present day. And so ultimately we have that same dichotomy that's happening in other visual constructions of the noble savage. Um, so here's another example just to um, sort of draw out that, um, that duality again. 
Uh, this is uh, Thomas Hicks oil painting of the very well-known uh, Seneca chief red jacket. And it's actually a copy of uh, Robert Weir's 1828 painting, but the reproductions of Hicks's uh, copy are much clearer. So that's why I use it. Um, but it's a very recognizable and very common sort of representation of the noble savage. Um, so on a very basic level, you know, looking at, at um, Hicks or Weir's uh, portrait on a very basic level, there's a primitive object, you know, the tomahawk in the figure's right hand um, that suggests to the viewer this sort of level of, you know, savage barbarism. And then there's the corresponding European or in this case, Euro-American object, the peace metal. You know, so this indicates an ability to, to sort of rise above these, these um, you know, primitive roots and benefit from white civilization. So, you know, a very typical sort of noble savage uh, stereotype. And with Weir's painting of Red Jacket, it's very clearly spelled out for us. Um, with Pharaoh, we don't necessarily have as much to go on, but perhaps that really sort of rough, brusque Native American face and the modern European or Euro-American suit can be seen to sort of achieve that same association. You know, maybe this is Homer's uh, sort of modern version of that old stereotype. Um, there's another stereotype arguably at play, um, I believe, and that is the, the stereotype of the vanishing Indian. Um, so interestingly, while I'm kind of drawn to the, um, the harshness of Pharaoh's face, um, it's also been understood and interpreted in a much more flattering manner. So um, John Strong, who's the uh, historian that I mentioned earlier, uh, he actually described Homer's portrait of Pharaoh as having um, a quiet strength and dignity, uh, looking out pensively at the world. And I believe that this interpretation uh, brings up some connections to the vanishing Indian stereotype. Uh, so throughout the 19th century, a lot of artists would depict uh, native subjects according to this constructed concept of extinction, right? This idea that Native Americans were just sort of quietly vanishing away. It was no one's fault. It was just a natural occurrence, you know, which we know is wildly false. Um, but this idea, you know, it, it, it falsely characterized Native Americans as a race of people who were more or less like destined to vanish in the face of white civilization. Um, so the vanishing Indian, it was, it was maybe most prevalent in literature, you know, think James Fenmore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, which was published in 1826. And uh, this is a 1926 uh, edition cover that I'm showing you. Um, it was also very common in theater. Uh, these sort of tragic, heroic Indian chiefs were also very common in early American theater. This is a um, uh, engraving of Edwin Forrest playing uh, Metamora, the last of the Wampanoags. This was a, an 1829 uh, theater production in New York. Um, and the visual arts as well. You know, here's a, a really powerful example from the visual art world. Um, so in the 18, late 1830s and 1840s, uh, George Catlin, he was touring uh, what he called his Indian gallery all over the United States and Europe. Uh, this was his collection of uh, Indian portraits and landscapes, um, you know, depicting uh, Indian figures and, and practices and ways of life. Um, he was a a very strong proponent of the idea that Indians were vanishing and you know, destined to continue to vanish from the North American continent. Um, he published a lot of writing along with his visual art. And when he set out on his, um, like his Western travels from New York in the early 1830s and, and when he traveled West, this was when he completed all of the artworks for his Indian gallery. Uh, when he set out on those uh, travels west, he proclaimed it to be um, here. It, he proclaimed it to be his mission uh, to capture the manners, customs, and character of uh, what he called an interesting race of people who are rapidly passing away from the face of the earth. He said that Native Americans were a dying nation who have no historians or biographers of their own to portray with fidelity their native looks and history. And it was his plan to rescue 
from a hasty oblivion what could be saved for the benefit of posterity and perpetuate the memory of a truly lofty and noble race. Um, so his artwork and his writing you know, really fueled that understanding of Native Americans as just sort of quietly vanishing away uh, from the North American continent you know, through no one's fault. Um, it was just a natural occurrence. Um, and then many artworks, like um, one that I've shown before, Tompkins Madison's Last of the Race, um, you know, artworks like these were exhibited at major art institutions, you know, places like the American Art Union and the National Academy of Design, and they were reproduced in their bulletins. Um, so these types of vanishing Indian stereotypes were just everywhere. And they, you know, they attributed the decline in indigenous populations to some kind of biological or inherent inferiority, you know, rather than the targeted federal warfare that was being waged against indigenous populations. Um, so often within the visualization of this type of constructed understanding or stereotype, often within these visualizations of the vanishing Indian, a contemplative pose or, or a contemplative stance, it kind of insinuates this type of passive acceptance. So that makes me wonder, you know, if there might be more meaning behind what can be understood in Homer's portrait as what John Strong calls, you know, this quiet strength and dignity looking out, you know, pensively at the world. You know, maybe Homer was just painting what he saw if we go back to the um, to the essay by Charles Parsons and Harper, you know, according to Parsons, um, Pharaoh was a, an industrious, quiet citizen. So maybe this is Homer's interpretation of that. Um, whatever we're seeing, we know that Homer made intentional choices um, in how he depicted Pharaoh, and he chose to depict the Montauk at Sachem, you know, the symbol of authority for an entire population sort of looking down with his hands folded across his chest. And, and the pose becomes a pretty loaded detail in the work, particularly because Homer eliminated almost everything else. You know, there's no context to um, provide us with a different understanding. You know, and if we look at some of the history on Long Island, um, Pharaoh certainly did have a lot to contemplate at the time of Homer's portrait. The Montauket were going through, you know, some very serious and, and really devastating changes uh, at the time that Homer um, painted this portrait. Um, so going back a ways, uh, uh, there's um, an early census record that, that states that uh, in 1703, so the beginning of the 18th century, uh, at this time, the Montauket were granted perpetual land rights on the Montauk Peninsula, and their population at that time was said to be over 10,000 resident members. Um, so that was the beginning of the 18th century. And then by the time that Pharaoh was elected sachem uh, in 1870, so 170 years later, you know, the Montauket were really struggling to retain land on eastern Long Island over the course of the 19th century. Uh, their numbers dwindled significantly. And it's a, it's a very ugly um, history. You know, European landowners and proprietors in Long Island, uh, you know, systematically disempowered the Montaukets through, you know, reportedly very underhanded and, and very violent means. Um, in 1878, so that was the year of Pharaoh's death, um, four years after the portrait, uh, trustees of East Hampton uh, took control of all Montaukett land uh, and and set it for partition. Uh, they sold it the following year to Arthur Benson, who was a land developer from Brooklyn. Uh, there are still ongoing struggles for land reclamation on uh, Eastern Long Island, and I'm not 100% sure where those um, battles are are at in the uh, present day. But you know, they their land was essentially taken, um, and they're still fighting to to get it back. And so when Homer painted Pharaoh, you know his his people were engaged in this really profound struggle against, you know, federal and state governments to keep and reclaim land. Uh, so maybe the contemplative pose is, is Homer's understanding of Pharaoh kind of under the weight of this whole process. Um, but I'm really left wondering if, if Homer tried to, you know, dignify Pharaoh's struggle as, as John Strong suggested, you know, with a quiet strength and dignity. 
you know, or does the pose just sort of align Pharaoh with this whole trove of American visual and popular culture that, that actually diluted the process of Indian removal and Indian dispossession down to this, you know, very simple uh, symbolic stereotype. Um, and I should point out too that, that Homer's actual knowledge of Montaukett politics is completely unknown. So um, like that, that doesn't really give us any answers. Um, and ultimately I'm not even sure how much, you know, Homer's understanding of Montaukett politics or his intention uh, with this work, I'm not even sure how much that actually mattered because at this time in the 19th century, more or less all representations of Native Americans were, were sort of filtered through, you know, fear and desire and political motive. Um, Indian stereotypes just saturated the visual arts. So, you know, regardless of Homer's reputation for truthfulness and even regardless of any attempt at truthfulness in this work, um, if there was one, this, this sort of culture of, this culture of stereotypes and misunderstandings um, I believe would have probably prevented a white audience from reading Homer's depiction of Pharaoh in any other way. Um, the portrait was likely to be understood as a stereotype because sadly that's just how Native Americans were viewed at the time. Um, the only thing that may have challenged a stereotyped reading would have been some kind of targeted context uh, to redirect the viewer, but Homer chose not to really offer uh, any context. So it, it you know, leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Um, so with the time I have left, there's one other aspect of this portrait that I'd like to consider. Um, and that is uh, Pharaoh's own response to it, which we may actually have uh, evidence of. Um, so in, uh, it was June of 1878. So this was um, four years after Homer's portrait and the, the year of Pharaoh's death. Uh, excuse me, in June of 1878, um, several members of this group called the Tile Club uh, took a tour of the Long Island countryside. And the Tile Club was a, a fraternal organization that was founded uh, in the early 1870s. Um, members were, you know, painters and sculptors, illustrators, architects. Um, there were some authors and writers. Uh, Homer was actually a founding member of the Tile Club, uh, but he was not present on this uh, particular trip to Long Island. Some records indicate that he had actually left the group by this time. Um, the trip itself, though, it was uh, pretty well documented. There were uh, two writers for Scribner's Monthly, which was another popular magazine at the time. Uh, two writers published an account of the trip, and uh, here are a couple pages uh, from the essay that they published. Um, so the Tile Club's tour of Long Island ended with a visit to Montauk Point and a visit to the home of David Farrow. So this was just before Pharaoh's death. Um, he was infirm at the time. He was, you know, essentially on his deathbed. Um, these are the pages uh, from the essay that describe the Tile Club's encounter with Pharaoh. And um, I doubt that you can uh, see the text that well, but I'm just going to read you a few uh, passages uh, from the essay. So the authors describe Pharaoh. They describe what they call... Um, and I'm quoting from the essay now, once valorous Montauk, so they're conflating the place with the people, uh, the once valor valorous Montauk nation is having been reduced to a pitiful handful. Um, they were led by their last king, Pharaoh, who was dying in a windswept cabin. So the description of Pharaoh kind of sets the stage for the group's, you know, like firsthand interview with him. And this is how they, they actually describe their encounter with Pharaoh. Uh, they say King David Pharaoh was lying as still as a marble image on the outside of his bedclothes. Only his eyes moved around quick and brilliant. His hollow face was of pure Indian type, but reduced almost to a skull. One or two drew to the bedhead and opened a low voice conversation. The tourists thought of the extinction of the Montauks and rather brutally asked King Pharaoh if he had children. He rolled his glittering eyes from one to another and slowly delivered an answer fraught 
with the gloomy considerations that must have been occupying his life. Yes, yes, the boys don't all go out to sea. Some of them are left and get married. They'll keep us up a while longer. I just love that. So they're relying pretty heavily on Pharaoh's popular and and inaccurate representation as last of the Montauks. And, you know, I just love how Pharaoh rolls his eyes and kind of brushes it off as ridiculous. Um, okay, so after this, they get to the point where the artists want to draw him. Um, and then continuing from the essay, it says, an eager artist had taken out a sketchbook. Would you object to having your portrait taken for us to remember you by? The answer was a withering criticism on the work of some previous artist. Yes, he drawled slowly, I wouldn't like to. There was an insulting sketch of me made some time ago. Um, so you can see the portrait that was published uh, with the Scribner's Monthly Essay. It's on the bottom uh, left of the rightmost page. Um, and here's a, a closer look. Um, so this is the um, this is the tile that they created. This was their um, portrait of Pharaoh from the um, from the visit from the sketch that they did on the visit. Um, Pharaoh's reply to their request for a portrait, though, is very interesting to me. He very directly criticized a previous portrait of himself by another artist. Um, so from what I've read, only one scholar has ever sort of ventured a guess as to whether Pharaoh was referring to Homer when he talks about this insulting sketch. Um, so Abigail Gertz, she co-authored a, a huge monograph on Homer some years ago, and, and in her discussion of Homer's portrait of Pharaoh, she mentions the Tile Club visit. And she asserts that there is, I'll just read you what she says. She says, there is nothing in the character of Homer's drawing that would suggest it was the insulting sketch Pharaoh held so firmly in memory. Doubtless King Pharaoh was memorialized by many artists. I'm not so convinced though. You know, Pharaoh was somewhat of a local celebrity in the 1870s, but this deathbed recollection of a single sketch is kind of telling. And I wonder if this suggests that he may not have sat for an abundance of portraits in his life, lifetime. Um, and he had a lot of reasons to dislike Homer's portrait. It's unflattering. It strips him of any context. And Homer may very well have stereotyped him as the last remaining member of his nation, you know, which he very obviously was not. So. Um, I, I am prone to believe that that Pharaoh was referring to Homer's work and that he just really did not like it. Um, I can see that it's just about seven o'clock. Um, I think I'm going to take that as my um, cue to finish up and I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen if I need to go back and share it again to look at any, any images, if there are any questions, I would be happy to. Um, but other than that, I would just like to thank you all um, for listening and, and I'm happy to take any comments or answer any questions if you have them. Hang on, I'm not, can you hear me, Nancy? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna go into Q&A. Uh, no open questions. Ah. All right. Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Okay, I'm sending a message, so I'm not sure. To all the panelists. Gabby, that's only for the panelists. Okay, so I, I do not see anything in the Q&A. Um, there's one. 
Okay, Joan, so Joan Rockwell says, thank you, Nancy. I really enjoyed it. Um, okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Nancy? I have one. Um, did Homer make any other paintings of Montauk subjects? Montauk um, subjects? No, that's actually an interesting question. And um, that's a, a um, something that I spend a little bit more time uh, on in the kind of larger, my larger approach to this subject. He did not paint any other uh, Montauket subjects, but he did do a watercolor series uh, about 20 years later of Montagny Indians in Quebec uh, while he was up there on one of his many fishing and hunting trips. And um, these are, I find these a very interesting uh, sort of backdrop to read the uh, Pharaoh portrait against because um, these are paintings that are just full of context. Um, there, there are no individual um, subjects that we can identify in them the way that we can identify Pharaoh. Uh, but the Montagny paintings are, are the only other, to my knowledge, the only other example of uh, indigenous subjects throughout Homer's entire career. And they're just a, a very different uh, type of painting. So he never did any other Montauket, uh, but he did do Native Americans uh, at one other time during his career. Okay, from Kayla or to all panelists and attendees. I really enjoyed this webinar. Thank you for hosting, definitely learned a lot. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions? From Thank Barbara you. Frank to all panelists. Thank you, Nancy, fascinating. <laughs> Okay, if nobody else has any more questions, then um, I think perhaps we'll wrap this up. And thank you, Nancy, very much for a very interesting uh, talk. And uh, we were delighted to have you. Oh, thank you so much. I was delighted to be here. And thank you, everyone, again, for attending. So basically, everyone is saying thank you. It was a fascinating, very interesting webinar. Thank so you. thank you again. Okay, I think that, that will wrap it up then. Thank you very much. Thank you.